In this tutorial, we'll look at how we can identify populations at risk under different sea level rise flood scenarios. In order to identify populations at risk, we need to turn to data from the U.S. Census. The U.S. Census counts every resident in the United States once every 10 years as mandated by the Constitution. The primary purpose of this is to allocate the proper number of representatives for every state. The demographic data that's collected is reported at various scales, from the nation as a whole down to individual neighborhoods, but not for individuals. The census units that are used are important to understand because this is what we're going to rely on to model the populations that are affected. The easiest way to understand this is to start with a place, and in census speak that essentially means a city or a town. In New England, it happens to refer to what they call county subdivisions, but again, we're just talking about towns or cities. We can get an individual number for each city or town, indicating the number of people, for example, that live in that city or town. But that town can be broken further down into what are called census tracts. These are subunits, essentially, and these can give us a slightly more detailed view of the distribution of the population within that city or place. Census tracts themselves can be further broken down into block groups. And finally, we can go all the way down to individual blocks, which are essentially equivalent to city or neighborhood blocks. And that's about the smallest we can get to in, from, in terms of getting population data. And this is what we'll use for our tutorial. When you map them out, they kind of look like this. Here we're looking at census block, uh, excuse me, census tracts and looking at household income, one of the various demographics that can be collected and displayed. We'll be focusing though simply on population numbers. So how do we model then the population affected by flooding? Let's assume that we start with a neighborhood or a census block and it has an area of one, it could be one acre, one square mile, and the population of that neighborhood or census block is four. Let's assume that flooding occurs. If it's, if it's the entire area that's covered under water under flooding scenario, it's very simple. We can, just say the, we can say the entire population has been affected by the flooding. But what happens if only a portion of that neighborhood is flooded? How do we identify the population that's affected? Well, the simplest thing to do would be to assume that the entire population is affected and simply take the entire number, four. But if we wanted to be a little more sophisticated, we could take into account the proportion of the area that was flooded and use that to figure out what proportion of the population is affected. So let's assume then that the flooding affects about 25% of the neighborhood area, or about a quarter of it. If we take that 0.25 and multiply it by the population of that neighborhood, we come up with an estimate of the number of people that would be affected in that neighborhood. Now this is of course is assuming that the population is evenly distributed across the neighborhood, which is a bit of a stretch, but it's not unreasonable. And so this is the technique that we're going to use in this tutorial. The first thing that we're going to need to do is to acquire the census geography and census geography data. This can be acquired from a variety of sources. The easiest one for us is MassGIS, but if you don't have access to that, you can always go to the census itself, and specifically you'd be looking for TIGER data, T-I-G-E-R, which is the name referring to the geography the census offers. But again, we're going to use MassGIS for our purposes since we're working in Massachusetts. From the MassGIS uh, data layers page, we're looking for the 2010 U.S. Census data, which is the latest at the time of this recording. On that page, you'll see that the very first option talks about a variety of scales or, or units of census that we can acquire. We're looking for the first download, which is going to give us uh, the shapefiles for census uh, blocks, block groups, and tracks, but we're only going to be using blocks for this instance. So it's a fairly large file, about uh, a little over 80 megs, so it might take some time to download. But once you download it, what you should uh, end up with is a a zip file that we need to unzip into a directory. Um, and again, it may be fairly large uh, because it's a, a large file and contains a lot of data in it. But we're only interested again in the block layer. So in fact, what we really want are just these uh, files. Um, but we'll leave them there and we'll access them through ARC. In ArcGIS, we're looking at a map that I've composed previously showing the community of interest, in this case, Marblehead, Massachusetts as well as uh, different flood polygons that we've previously created. And we'll be working with the 16-foot or the highest uh, flood possibility scenario in this case. And so I'm going to add the um, shapefiles that I just unzipped into my directory. So again, we're just working with the blocks poly. 
and we'll add there and you can see the various units and, and it should look familiar it actually follows a lot of common features in the landscape which include roads and you might notice that in the layout of those blocks but they're irregularly sized which is common um, we want to of course be familiar with this data so if we open the attribute table for the data we'll find that it contains a variety of forms of data some of which are going to be somewhat cryptic uh, the important thing here that we really want to observe is that every block unit contains the name of the town or city that, to which it belongs, or as the census would say, the county subdivision. Um, but importantly, what we're looking for is, of course, population data. So each unit has its uh, population as well as a number of housing units, which is used for other purposes. In any case, uh, we have the data in the table, so that's what we're really after. If we wanted to visualize it, of course, we could go to the properties for this layer and then choose to display it by population. And when we look at it there, we can see how the population varies across the community. The first thing that we need to do, though, is we need to isolate the um, blocks that belong to just our community. So I'm going to drag the blocks down just a bit below the Marblehead boundary so you can see uh, the boundary of our community as well as the flood area. Um, we could isolate those blocks in a variety of ways. We could use uh, a clip function. We could use a select by location. But the thing you want to be a little careful about in this particular instance is that the census geography um, is slightly different from the layers that we used for our communities. And that's just because they come from different sources. And although they're generally the same, if you look really closely at some of the edges, you're going to see that the boundary, the black line for our community, kind of cuts a little bit through this census geography. Let me turn the flood off for a second. Um, and it shouldn't. It should really follow the same geography, but it, it doesn't. It's just simply they're two different data sources. So if we do a clip uh, or even a select by location, we're going to end up either missing some polygons or, or uh, worse, creating slivers. So one of the nicer things that's available here is the fact that when you look at the attribute table again, you might have remembered that we have the actual designation of the town to which each block belongs. So in this particular case, we're going to use a select by attributes function to identify just the blocks that belong to our um, community. So in this case, it's real town equals, and I'm looking for just the blocks that belong to Marblehead. All right, so I put in a expression real town equals Marblehead and apply that. And what we'll end up with is about 439 records that have been selected. And these correspond to uh, the ones that belong to Marblehead. So now we're going to export this selected layer to our GeoDatabase so that we can just work on that and, and uh, save ourselves processing time as well as enable ourselves to compare what is affected to the total population of the community. So um, I'm going to right click on the layer of census blocks and I'm going to take that selection and export it. So I'm going to go to data, export data, and it's going to prompt me to just take the select features and I'm going to export this to my geodatabase. Now in order to do that I need to make sure that I've saved as type to file and personal geodatabase and I go into that geodatabase and I'm going to call this marblehead blocks and save that and I'm going to add that to the, to the map and I'm going to remove, turn off rather the old one. And so now I'm just working with the blocks that belong to Marblehead. And again, I can symbolize that by the population so that we can see what we're looking at in terms of population numbers and how the population is spread across the community. So now what I want to do is I want to be able to um, identify how much the population is affected. And so as I explained in the earlier part of this tutorial, we're going to essentially assume that the populations are uniformly distributed across each block and we're going to assume that if a proportion of a block is affected, the same proportion of the population is affected. So in this particular case, we are going to use uh, geoprocessing tools to clip the uh, census block layer using the flood polygons. Uh, and before I do that, um, when we do these kinds of operations, the, we're always going to create new output. So it's safest to set your environment so that it outputs to where you want it to go. So in this case, I'll set the workspace to go to my um, Marblehead uh, geodatabase, my personal geodatabase, and I'll do the same thing with the um, Scratch workspace so that the output automatically wants to go into that, and I'm less likely to lose something if I forget where I saved it. So under the geoprocessing menu, I'm going to go to the clip, 
and I'm going to set the um, set Marblehead blocks as the input feature, the thing being clipped, and then the clip feature is going to be the 16-foot um, flood polygons. And you can see already that it's defaulting to my personal geodatabase. Um, I'm going to add a little bit of number here. I'm going to put 16 so that I remember which one it was there. Just one other thing too, this XY tolerance might be useful in some cases if you suspect that you're going to end up with some um, slivers. So if you're going to end up with some really weird little pieces of polygon because of the geometry of the, of the flood and, and block layer, then you could specify a larger tolerance, uh, several meters for example, and anything that's smaller than that will simply get absorbed essentially by the nearest next to largest polygon. So again, you don't have to, but it's something to think about if you encounter problems with slivers. So now I'm going to hit OK, and it's going to clip those um, polygons. Okay, so now what I see, these purple polygons represent the uh, area of the um, of the, uh, the blocks that fell within the flood zone. And so when I open this attribute table, uh, what I'm going to see is, uh, is that they look essentially identical to what was there before. The data that's represented here is essentially copied over from the original data. Now, you want to notice here that the original data we work with is a shapefile, and shapefiles um, don't automatically update themselves. So if they have um, area values inside of them, those area val values, for example, right here, are static. They don't update when you change the shape of the geometry. But as soon as you make a layer into a geodatabase feature class, the geodatabase feature class always appends a couple of columns that have updated areas. Um, that are dynamically updated as you change the geometry, but they're in the units of the um, coordinate system. So this shape length and shape area are in meters, so square meters and meters, whereas the original areas were in, well, you see them, square feet or acres. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to determine um, what proportion of the original area was clipped by the flood polygon. So we're going to add a new field in here where we're going to calculate the new area in terms of the um, uh, acres in this case and we're going to call it new acres okay and we're going to save it as a float so it can accommodate um, decimals and then what we're going to do is use a calculate geometry to determine the area in acres so it's set to area, and we want to do acres, U.S. acres. Say OK. And it warns you that you're working on it. So, so now you see these numbers here. And we're, we're calculating acres because we're going to use the original acres in order to calculate the proportion of area that was carried over from the clip. So we'll add another column, another field. We'll call it Z area. Essentially the proportion of the area that was captured by the clip and again a float because we're going to end up with some decimal points All right, and then we're going to in this one we're going to calculate the percentage of area that was retained through the clip so this one's a field calculator operation and we're going to take the new area the new acres right that we just calculated a second ago and divide it by the original area acres that came with the shapefile and we're doing this because, again, this is going to yield a proportion. So when we hit OK, we'll end up with these fractional numbers that represent the proportion of the block that was clipped by the flood area. So now we're just about there. So now what we're going to do is we're going to calculate the total population affected, assuming that it's the same proportion of the population. So we're going to add one more field, and we're going to call it, I'm going to call it new pop. You can call it anything you like. In this case, we're going to leave it as a short integer, as a, essentially a whole number, because since we're dealing with people, it doesn't make sense to have fractional people. But again, this is all calculated, so it doesn't really matter. In this case, we're going to do a field calculation again, and this time what we're going to do is we're going to take the old population, and we're going to multiply it by the proportion of area 
okay? And then we end up with are these integers representing the number of people within those blocks assuming they were equally spread across the area. So now what we have in this clipped area is a measure of the population that falls within each of those blocks that was clipped by the flood polygon. And so now if we wanted to figure out how many people that was, well that's a pretty simple operation. We go to the attribute table and we ask for the statistics on that last column and we can see that 645 people fall right within that flood area and assuming they're equally distributed. 645, well keep, in mind, keep that number in mind. We look at the original population So the original population had 19,808 people. So if we wanted to find out what proportion of the Marblehead population, we simply take 645 divided by 19,808, and we say that about 3% of the population would be affected by this particular flood scenario, and we just need to repeat it for the other flood scenarios. And there we go.